Welcome everyone to our webinar on finding robust solutions for water and food security in the face of COVID. I am Marisa Escobar, the Water Program Director at SEIUS in our office in Davis, California. A little bit of a screen orientation. You can double click and toggle between videos and slides and you should be able to have access to the Q&A and chat functions that I see some of you are already uh, using right now at the bottom of the page. This is one of many SEI webinars on the COVID theme and potentially one of the most important ones given the relevance of water as the essential factor in keeping safe conditions for the recovery from the pandemic. We have a packed agenda with five wonderful speakers located in Ecuador, Morocco, Boston and California uh, and Sweden as well and a diverse set of people from that five different nationalities. So many things are happening in the world now that it makes us wish that it all stops and that we can think. Uh, when we are talking about water, we really can stop, in particular, because this is an essential um, element for everyone to access in, in this pandemic. So let me start by recognizing that water management can be very abstract sometimes. So how does it happen? It really happens through people working at government institutions, like ministries of the environment or regional water authorities or at water utilities or community-based organizations who need to continuously be making decisions about water use and allocations. These decisions range from operations to construction to infrastructure to conservation, to providing water access to remote sites. Nusha from our panel calls these the rainbow of options. But when something like COVID happens, how can water managers make decisions now and continue to find robust solutions? What we have seen is that first, what they have to deal with is the emergency. And underlying those emergency actions is the fact that in the past, it was not possible to find the robust solutions that could precisely help them plan for uncertain circumstances like the one we are living in. We at SEI have been doing for the past 10 years a, a promotion of a mixed approach that combines three factors. First, engaging with actors in making decisions. And this is important because water systems are complex and they require a set of stakeholders to be involved so they can identify and plan for robust solutions from the rainbow of options. Second, using data and information to connect the scales from the community level to the state level and beyond, as many local decisions are influenced by global processes. And third, communicating this information in transparent ways so water utilities and government government institutions can use it to make decisions. We have used these three steps to identify options that can make water systems resilient. Our panelists will provide example, examples of how this has been possible or not under the current pandemic situation, looking what, at what has happened so far and looking to the near and mid-term future where we have an opportunity to mobilize recovery funds that will help water managers and the whole water community identify and implement robust and resilient solutions. I encourage you all to ask questions as people are talking on the Q&A window at the bottom of our screen. Uh, we'll have Jack Siever helping with the technology behind the screens. And now I'll leave you with our senior scientist, Annette Huber-Lee, We'll moderate the panel. Annette, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Marisa. I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity to, um, to share our thoughts, learn from our panelists, and in particular, to learn from those of you who are joining us today. I'm just gonna run through some quick logistics. So each of our five panelists will speak from five to eight minutes. Um, some with slides, some without. Um, and then this will be followed by a half hour discussion that will largely be driven by the questions and comments that you give 
So at the bottom of your screen, you should see um, a little area that says Q&A. If you click on that, it would open up. Um, and please give us feedback throughout the conversation. Um, one of my colleagues, Brian, will be um, curating those questions and comments and we'll feed those into the discussion we'll have with the full panel. So I'd like to um, introduce our first panelist. I'm honored <laughs> to collaborate with Professor Lassen Kenny, who is based in Morocco. Um, I would just quickly say I've gotten to know him through a collaboration funded by uh, Swedish SIDA in collaboration with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization that's looking at water sustainability and in, in our role in particular is around the water energy food nexus in Jordan and Morocco. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand over to uh, Professor Kenny. Thank you. Okay, thank you Annette. Thank you for uh, having me today for well, this is a very important uh, webinar about these issues uh, related to COVID-19. I was asked to present briefly uh, what we can learn from the uh, Moroccan experience in dealing with water issues, food security in the face of COVID-19. And uh, I have only very few minutes, so I'll be very brief. Uh, I think Morocco as a Mediterranean North African country has been facing severe ground for many, many, many years. And uh, this has pushed public authorities in Morocco and also in other countries to acquire some kind of proactive behavior toward crisis, be it uh, from growth, pandemics and others. And that is very important. So I'll try to cover the topics by lying down a few answers and trying to answer three questions. First one is how efficient is our current uh, uh, water food policy in the face of pandemics? Second question will be related to the production and distribution systems. How efficient is it and how can we improve it for the future? And the last one would be about the consumer behavior, which is very important. I think consumers have also responsibility uh, on, on improving the system. Uh, so, uh, uh, these are the three questions I will cover quickly, and these are the three questions I think the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted in different way, a different magnitude, and for each of these questions, I think we have some good lessons to draw in the future. So, first one, next slide, Jack, uh, would be about water policy. I think, I think when it comes to water policies, countries like Morocco, where water shortage, as I said, is a structural chronic constraint, it seems that a a long investment in building strong water infrastructure nationwide to support irrigation agriculture system is a strategic choice that has to be reinforced from the futures. This has proven to be a very efficient. So I think on this point, Morocco is a good example. The country has launched 60, 70 years ago, a very aggressive national program on building dams, convey irrigation networks all over the countries. And as I said, this has to be to be very efficient, quite efficient uh, in ensuring food security, at least for some uh, uh, product like fruit, vegetables, meat, and milk. In fact, uh, during the confinement, uh, we in Morocco here have experienced no shortage or whatsoever for fruit, vegetables, oil, or sugar in Morocco. Uh, 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 this is not, unfortunately, it's not the case for other products like cereals, legumes, pulses that are essential for proteins. And for these uh, products, Morocco and many other African countries and North African countries are relying on import most of, the, uh, most of the time. So they are relying on virtual water. Is this a right policy? I think the pandemic crisis tells us not so sure. In fact, once the, the whole international uh, trade system is shut down, food security for this kind of product became questionable. So this is kind of, I think, strategic orientation we have to rethink for the futures. Then we can go to the uh, uh, production and distribution systems. I think we have uh, some very uh, critical questions to ask ourselves, and that has been confirmed with the pandemic crisis. Uh, the first one is uh, related to uh, uh, the risks of losing some 
food security potential simply because of pollution. And we do have some uh, water lost because of pesticide residues, because of nitrite residues, sometimes salinity. So, uh, and on that issue, I think we need to reinforce the sustainable cropping system for the futures. This is an unavoidable uh, for a robust system in the futures. And uh, uh, as for the quality issues, we have also this brackish water issues. Uh, many countries are producing billions of tons of water, wastewater that are wasted, that are not used. Uh, although uh, we do have now the appropriate technology, appropriate system to treat these waters and make use of it. I think uh, for the future, we need to consider non-conventional water to be integrated in our modeling. And I'm gonna simply uh, 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 remind something which I've read recently. Some, some searchers have raised the questions of having uh, coronavirus uh, uh, traces in wastewaters. And some laboratories are suggesting to use wastewater for tracing COVID-19 in some uh, municipalities, which is good, but it should not be an obstacle of using this wastewater for the viewers the, to, to, for different uses, particularly for uh, some specific crops. So these quality questions are very important. Then we have, I think, three good lessons from trade, marketing, and supply chains perspectives. Uh, as we experienced here in Morocco, I, I think in other countries, uh, the, 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 the fact to, lead, to let the small farmers uh, get into short supply chain and sell their product directly to the uh, consumer was a very good option. And farmers were very happy because they gained their money and consumers were very happy because they get fresh fruit at low price. And so it's basically a win-win situation thanks to the uh, uh, social networking here. So I think social networking combined to a uh, short supply chain would be something to consider for the futures. Likewise for international uh, trade and export. Uh, for many, many years, farmers have been asking to ease the process of administrative exchange of data, exchange of uh, document, exchange particularly of uh, phytosanitary certificates. So, well, during the pandemic, this has been done for three weeks, within three, three weeks. And this is something people were waiting for it for many, many years. So I think that kind of positive impact of the uh, COVID-19 pandemics on the, on the uh, value chain process. So all of these questions, I think, are uh, telling us that, uh, 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 of course, we have listened to take. And let me finish with one more comment. That is uh, related to the consumer questions here. Uh, I think right in the beginning, uh, uh, when the COVID-19 broke up all over the world, a medical expert were telling us that one uh, of the best way to fight virus is to improve immunity system immunity systems and we know that this is linked to nutrition and it states to what we are eating what we are eating and what kind of diet we are having and we have also nutritionists that have been telling us that some diets like the mediterranean diet are very good for our health because they improve the immunity systems well the good news is this kind of diet have also the lowest water footprint which means by shifting from a, let's say, a kind of uh, American uh, eating diet based on what you have in mind to kind of uh, Mediterranean diet, uh, one can save like 25 persons of the daily consumption of water. That's basically 1500 liters per day. So I think it's, uh, this is a very smart way to uh, uh, mix uh, business with uh, pleasure, as we say. So water footprint is very important to consider in the future also in evaluating the, uh, the, the water uh, management issues. And my last word would be about the complexity of these issues. It is very complex, as uh, Marisa said in the beginning, and because it is very complex, we, uh, we cannot rely on simple solution. I think one way to tackle this question would be to rely on the nexus approach. That's what uh, something we're working on, FAF, FAO, SAE, and other international bodies are working on it. But the health component, the health dimension 
is not integrated in this nexus. So I think the COVID-19 story here is telling us to absolutely integrate the health questions into the nexus approach. So that's, that's what I have to say. And I would like to end up with just one last comment. I think the COVID-19 pandemics has shown us that people and uh, communities that are uh, used to face crisis they did manage to have some proactive actions and people and communities are not used to face crisis. They had more problem in dealing with the coronavirus. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, oh. Thank you, Lawson. That was really interesting. I, I love some of the points that you made that I hope we can pick up in the, in the Q&A around the positive and negative impacts of COVID. There's a way it's, the, this crisis has mobilized us in ways we hadn't known we'd be able to do. Um, this point around virtual water and consumer behavior, I think is also one of these issues that are um, really important for us to consider. You know, do we move towards, do countries make decisions to move towards food self-sufficiency? Is that the answer for this? Um, or do we continue thinking in terms of virtual water and efficient production? Uh, the last comment you made is actually a fantastic <laughs> transition to our next panelist um, in terms of the work that SEI has been doing in, in linking water planning or basin scale planning with uh, water and sanitation and health. And so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, Laura Forney. Um, you'll hear about some work she's doing in Bolivia, but my work with her is, uh, is connected to some extent in a USAID-funded sustainable water partnership in Cambodia, where she's done very similar sort of works, work to what you'll hear in this CETA-funded project in, in Bolivia. So with that, could I um, ask Laura to share some thoughts with us? Thank you, Annette. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with such a wonderful group of colleagues and with a lot of our water community around the world. I'm here to talk about uh, Latin America, water and, and COVID-19. As you can see um, in the graph, uh, Latin America is the new epicenter of COVID-19 and based on the latest articles from the New York Times and the economies, the situation is not going to, uh, it's only going to get worse. Um, you can see in the graph, there's some countries that are having uh, some exponential growth in the number of cases and some are maintaining the number of cases in a constant trend, but none of them are really going down. Um, the region is facing many challenges. Um, in the prevention response of, of COVID-19 because of many reasons, from different leadership styles to a uh, large number of people working in the informal sector, which makes it really hard to stay at home and, and fit your family, to the number of slums in the large cities, which is difficult to contain the spread of the virus on, on the poor conditions, um, with great economic and social inequalities and with limited financial capital to sustain the economy and its people. Today, um, we're going to talk about the interlinkages of COVID-19 and water, which are many, and uh, water is a vital resource, uh, is intrinsically connected to our ecosystem, economic activities, and our livelihood. And we're hearing today about these linkages uh, from our panel members on various topics, and various parts of the world, we may need another <laughs> webinar. I think there's too many connections that we need to explore. But today I'm going to discuss um, covenant in water and social inequalities in the context of Latin America. I'm very sad to say that I think any gains achieved in the region in the reduction of poverty and inequality may have been raised with the pandemic. Uh, the realities is that some people are facing Latin America um, are heartbreaking, uh, in particular in the most vulnerable um, parts of, of Latin America. The truth is that the reduction of inequality has been a major challenge in the region. And unfortunately, it's having um, strong connections with the degradation of, of our environment and, and ecosystem. Uh, I think that that's why the environmental policies around um, the protection of our environment can also work in tandem with 
poverty reduction efforts and they should be linked to contribute to sustainability and people's well-being. So I'd like to share about our project that we have under a project called Bolivia Watch. Um, and it's about Tupisa, a watershed located in Bolivia, uh, in the south part of Bolivia, limited with Argentina and, and Chile. Uh, poverty levels in, in this region, in Tupisa, are high. People are often uh, migrating to other parts for, um, in the search of better income. And they go to large cities, other large cities in Bolivia, but they also go to Argentina and, and Chile for, for work. And mainly the type of work is informal, uh, in the informal sector. With the pandemic, most of the people are staying at home, finding ways to sustain their families. We know that staying at home um, is not the same for, for everybody. Um, in our project, we did a survey and the results show that 30% of the rural households lack access to water in their homes. And the water they get from the river is not only unsafe for drinking, but also polluted from mining upstream and human waste. The main economic activities in Tupisa are agriculture, mining, and tourism. As the number of tourists are reduced to zero, and as migration is not an option anymore, Agricultural mining are the two main options, and most of the growers are small landholders with less than a hectare of land, and that allows them to secure food for the family and support the local markets. Um, however, agriculture is not the main source of income. Uh, mining is. In the survey, we found that 16% of the households um, indicated that they have worked in mining in the last 12 months. But that number changes uh, in various men of the, based on the relative prices of, of metals. When mining provides better income more than agriculture, many men find the need to work in mining. Uh, this is an industry that in Tupisa is polluting the rivers and they're threatened ecosystems, affecting their agricultural yield um, when they irrigate the crops and the health of many community members, including children who drink that water. Mining has stopped in the initial spread of the virus, but in May they have returned to normal operations. So the main challenge here is how can we find robust solutions that can provide income for disadvantaged communities without negatively impacting our water uh, ecosystem and ecosystem services that water provides. One thing that is evident from this pandemic is that existing inequalities uh, unfortunately are going to increase and causing, in addition, increasing negative impacts to the water and the ecosystem. In particular, in areas with limited access to water, with limited access to land, to capital, and with weak institutions. COVID-19 is showing the importance of reducing those inequalities. So in this project, in Tupisa, as part of Bolivia Watch, we continue um, working with our local partners and with our colleagues to uh, combine information of the survey and more like socially based and, and, and qualitative based information with the technical base with, with results and the water modeling that we do to identify the hotspots and the vulnerable regions and inform actions that are robust in this very uncertain future but can also contribute to the reduction of poverty and social inequalities and improve the well-being of people living within those watersheds. So uh, thank you very much and I look forward to the questions in the discussion section. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> that was um, an excellent presentation. Um, but heartbreaking all the same. As we know, globally, the, this COVID-19 has exacerbated existing inequalities that have disproportionately affected the most vulnerable people. On the other hand, I think it's made us aware of the interdependence we have, that we're, the, um, we all interact with each other. And the hope is indeed that we find these robust investments that address the inequities and poverty that we see around the world. Um, 
I'd like to turn to our next speaker, another colleague uh, from the Stockholm Environment Institute based in, um, in Stockholm, Kim Anderson, who's uh, involved with us also in this CETA funded project in Bolivia, but really has global experience around sustainable sanitation um, and reuse of water. So if I could hand over to you, Kim, and I, I just to everybody, please keep the questions coming. And, and comments, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Annette. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm honored to, to join the nice set of, of colleagues. Um, uh, so uh, I will try to, to make the connections uh, with, with the wash, the water, sanitation, hygiene systems, and uh, talk about how if we kind of higher our ambitions uh, maybe we can also build build up stronger and have more resilience to future pandemics and other other crises so so you slightly see some of the, the talking points that i want to to make um, if we start uh, with the first one more on, on the more general wash and, and and the deficiency i guess no one uh, has missed like the, the the messages about hand washing uh, and how important that is to to contribute to stop virus from spreading between between people um, and we have heard a lot of uh, things that we we need to uh, wash our hands with soap more than more than 20 seconds and then carefully wash under running water but this this sounds easily enough uh, but if we consider what, what Laura said for Bolivia, for example, in that, that case, or if we look at the global situation where 3 billion people still lack the basic hand washing facilities, then we know that this basic uh, protection measure is not really accessible for 40% of the human population. So that's, that's really a kind of a crisis situation, I would say. Um, there is also some emerging evidence that virus may pre present in feces even after, uh, up to a month after that you have had respiratory symptoms of, of the disease. So this um, the immense lack of, of sanitation services, toilet, uh, households without toilets uh, is also a, a potential factor for, uh, for and source for spreading. But of course, the lack of toilet is also more of a, a, a private thing there where people have to leave their homes to to go to public toilets or out in the in the bush to do their their needs and of course if you're affected by disease and then have to to look for where to go that's that can be a real uh, nightmare of course um, if we look at the next bullet need for integrated inclusive wash i think there is also a risk with uh, having a lot of focus on, on hand washing and I think indirectly that can have focus on uh, focusing on water supply and we have seen in the past uh, looking at a project experience where there have been a really narrow focus, focus and investment in water supply in communities we have actually seen kind of almost like negative health impacts afterwards uh, because then you start to people start to use more water so it's, if, if it's not accompanied by with sanitation and, and kind of the social awareness of water culture, how to handle it, you can actually create more problem with stagnated water uh, contaminations in, in your communities. And the figure shows here that we actually need to have all these wash components together to have a, a real impact. If we just go for water quantity, for example, or water, water and water quality, we can reach maybe 30% 30, 30 uh, reduction in diarrhea, for example. Uh, while even high hygiene promotion could actually give, give us more if we, we know the basic of, of hygiene. So, but what we really need is to promote this integration. So uh, not, not only do water supply, for example, Go, go further. <laughs> and here it's also really important to look at uh, uh, inclusiveness. Um, we have vulnerable groups. We have seen this during the, the COVID uh, pandem pandemic. Uh, 
where where elderly, for example, um, are ex ex extremely uh, vulnerable. At the same time, if we look at wash and sanitation projects, when we have uh, revisited some of the some major wash programs in Africa, for example, we have seen that it's often these groups also that maybe don't take the steps to use these installations. There are some cultural uh, or other acceptance uh, barriers that, uh, that make them not use them. So we see them continue with open defecation, for example. So we really need to prioritize that the installations, the, the, the infrastructure is, is adapted uh, to their needs, but, but also that there are actually uh, behavior campaigns linked to to this this type of uh, interventions, so they actually uh, reach and and kind of convince uh, these vulnerable populations as well. Another part is the potential for doing more when it comes to resource management linked to wash system. Uh, with the wash system, we have water coming into the system, uh, but we have also everything we eat. In the end, it will end up in uh, in our waste streams. So this is a kind of untapped potential from a resilient perspective when it comes to water use. There we can do things having uh, more efficient low water flushing toilets, for example, or we can make sure that we treat and reuse uh, water that's been used locally, in irrigation in agriculture, for example. So, so there is one, one part, and of course, then we can strengthen resilience towards uh, different events, uh, interruptive, uh, disruptive uh, events, for example, uh, droughts. But the reuse uh, of nutrients, organic matter in our, our waste streams are also a way to, to strengthen, for example, sufficiency when it comes to agricultural production, uh, food security, and the link to nutrition, of course, that Kenny was talking about is, is of course, important. Um, we have seen studies that we have done uh, potential of Africa when it comes to uh, the, the nutrient content in human excreta. We've seen that uh, if we look at the total amount uh, of nutrients in, in that material compared to all the fertilizer that is consumed uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, the amount is quite equal. So actually, if, if we were able to reuse this material safely, we could actually double uh, the amount of fertilizers. And of course, that could have a really big impact on, on food security. And similar for, for energy, if we can recover uh, the organic waste streams in, uh, in, uh, in linked to our households and in our communities, there's a lot we can do making uh, biofuel and, and support that energy supply system. My last point is, is that we can also expand beyond WASH. Um, we, we at the CI, we have been working with kind of a, an intervention method where we actually look at risks outside of the kind of the, the WASH, the, the human hygiene, but also looking at other risk factors in communities when it comes to, to animal husbandry, uh, of course, the greater waste management to avoid vector spreading, for example. So there we have a, a, an assessment method where we can identify these risks and, and, and manage them. So, and of course, this is really relevant for COVID as well, considering how it, it was initiated with the links to, to wild, wild animals, for example. So it's important with that, that link as well. So uh, that's one of the tools that we have. Um, Clean and Green can, can help doing this assessment. We have other, other tools. Um, one when it comes to inclusiveness in, in decisions uh, and, and in design, for example, of wash system, the empowerment uh, wash index IWI uh, tool, EWI tool, uh, a revamp that is to look at the values of, of resource recovery in urban, urban areas, uh, for example, with the Bolivia Watch that Laura was talking about, that we are kind of developing a, a new tool looking at the wash, wash flow links to, to weep and water basin management, which we think, think will have, can have a big impact to, to look at these, these issues of resilience, strengthening resilience, and also 
this supply of food, energy, etc. So I think I, I stop there. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, Kim. That was fascinating. I mean, I, my hope is that, you know, finally, uh, could one good thing come out of this pandemic would be we, abs we raise the ambitions. We actually provide water and sanitation for every human being. Um, so I, I would hope we could see that happen. But I'm also fascinated by the, you know, sort of reconceiving the potential of uh, wastewater in particular, first of all, of course, integrated approaches, integrated not only around water and sanitation, but integrated into how we understand watersheds and risk. Um, and I think this ties in with what Lassen introduced in his talk around the potential for wastewater as a resource, as, as opposed to something we want to get rid of, um, that it can increase water, food, and energy security and make us more resilient. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our next panelist, Marta Escavaria, who has, we've been sort of honored to, to get to know, um, and in particular around her co-design of water funds around the globe. Um, so Marta, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you to Stockholm Environment Institute, Marisa, for inviting me to be here, and to the great panelists that are um, giving me some moments to make some comments. I'll be speaking as a practitioner, basically what I um, can access in terms of robust decision makers. As an outsider, I'm not government, I am not uh, necessarily civil society since we are a private company. Um, but we do have a mission in terms of conserving landscapes for conservation and in particular for sources of water. I think that the nexus, um, and whichever you're more interested in, but in general puts the discussion at another level globally in terms of understanding um, the linkages, the trade-offs that we make um, and get away from the sectoral point view that we have. And it is particularly complex in the water sector, which has been a sector that is highly sectoral. Um, so I think some of the elements that were highlighted by the different speakers, um, we have seen that COVID has highlighted the importance of um, food sovereignty, wherever we are, and sort of thinking about what that means. What is that equation in terms of food production, as well as the nutrition that it brings? as well as the water that it uses to be able to provide. And at another level, it has highlighted the importance of our WASH mandate. Um, I think wherever we go, water continues to be a basic human right that we need to ensure. And as highlighted by Laura, unfortunately, in Latin America, we still have a long ways to go. Um, not only is it important because of the sanitary crisis, but in general, we know that it is the cheapest investment that governments can make to improve livelihoods and to improve their competitiveness as an economy. So I think that's really important to bring to the forefront. Um, since my comments need to be brief in terms of time, I just want to highlight that for all of us who are here today, maybe as practitioners, maybe as researchers, maybe as government representatives, robust decision makers are even more important um, considering the COVID crisis as well as our climate change challenge, which is very much alive. And despite you know, what um, the focus of our attention has been in the last two months, we know that the risks are serious, especially because of the information that's coming out from big data about 2020 being the hottest year yet. So having said that, the importance of using these robust decision makers and making systems the most, in the most effective way is a real challenge for all of us. Um, and I think it speaks to all of us personally to think of practical ways to make that information meaningful most countries 
whether you're in the U.S. at the state level or maybe in, you know, whichever country you may be, there have been centralized coordinating entities for the crisis. And I think that is an incredible opportunity if we are strategic to move away from the sectoral perspective and to bring an integrated approach, a holistic approach to the information. When we talk about the nexus, which is a wonderful concept, concept and conceptually very powerful, it is hard to, to make it operational. So that's where I think working with the centralized emergency centers and bringing to the forefront what water can mean as a, you know, like a, as a unifying element, I think that is real and that is important to find the silver lining of all these possibilities. So having said that, I find that we need to make sure that the decision makers are working not only, you know, multi-sector level, but also multi-levels, right, in terms of central government, regional governments, local governments, community level. And then finally, reiterating how we can base our decisions in terms of science. And I think that's something that we're seeing countries like the United States struggling with something that we thought was already accepted. Decisions have to be based on science. But somehow the politicization of decision making has led to this ideological, um, you know, application uh, lens, right, on, on the science. So it's not only did we see it with the climate crisis, now we're seeing it with the COVID crisis. But if we can overcome this, and I think at least from my perspective in Latin America, we have seen, despite the tragedy, the centralized entities trying to make sure that they're basing their decisions on science, on the evidence, on the information. And that's where I think we can contribute to make sure that robust decision makers can take us to a better place. So thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you, Marta. That's a really interesting perspective that you bring. I mean, that we're what we really need are sort of uh, robust decisions that are based on science, which doesn't seem to be happening at all in the country I'm located in right now, um, to not lose sight of the very serious risks we face and have faced and will continue to face in an escalating way around climate change. Um, but I feel like you're, you're trying to give us a, a hopeful message here. We are seeing more coordination happening across sectors than we've seen in a very long time. And, and some pro promise, I think, around people starting to understand and appreciate the role of science in decision making. So with that, I'd like to introduce our final speaker, Nusha Ajami, who is, uh, from my perspective, what I would call a, a scholar practitioner you know, someone who's a scholar at Stanford University, been deeply immersed in water policy in California, including the water energy nexus. So Nusha, I'm handing over to you. Thank you, Anath. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, I appreciate being part of this process. I'm part of this panel. Lots of great presentations. Uh, I try to not fully reiterate a lot of things my colleagues mentioned, but I'll walk you through some of the challenges people or California is facing um, in face of this pandemic. Um, I guess uh, the first uh, part of this, since we are on a water, food, um, uh, and COVID-19 panel, is the disrupted uh, water and food supply chains uh, in California. I can, uh, you know, uh, highlighting the fact that uh, our commuter population has uh, has sort of diminished or reduced. So we don't have a lot of people who move from location to location to go to work during the day. So the water use in some of those communities have uh, decreased because of the change in population, day, day behind population, and the water use in other communities increased because people are working from home, which has its own financial and uh, financial implications for some of the water agencies to manage our resource. Also, the food chain, uh, food supply chain has been uh, disrupted um, due to, again, 
uh, partly because the schools are closed, restaurants are closed, the commuter population, again, some of these campuses, large campuses we have, for example, in the Bay Area, uh, such as Google's and Facebook's and, um, and other uh, uh, working locations that people go to and have lunches and uh, dinners or buy local food locally during the day, um, those have been sort of eliminated, which means that some of the farming community that depend on selling their supplies to those, um, um, those consumers uh, have been impacted significantly. Um, and then uh, also has a lot of, uh, again, since this is a very interconnected system, has a lot of water in, in implications as well. Um, another piece of this is the uh, focus on the disadvantaged communities because obviously um, uh, access to clean water has been highlighted uh, uh, in, or sort of even uh, uh, had re received a lot more focus during this pandemic because uh, hand washing is such a core part of preventing COVID-19 and its spread. And uh, unfortunately in California, uh, we have a major, uh, like a big community, about a million or over a million people who do not have access to clean water, uh, either due to um, lack of water or lack of uh, high quality water. And, uh, and this situation has not necessarily improved during this process. And even though uh, our new governor has, um, has put a lot of focus on improving access to clean water, um, the, uh, the challenges right now we are, um, but first of all, we faced this pandemic very quickly and there wasn't enough time to um, uh, fix some of the issues that we have. And then also because of the financial implications of COVID-19, uh, the challenge of investing in some of these communities is gonna be uh, real and we have to find alternative ways to find money uh, to improve access to clean water in California. Another piece of this, again, uh, sort of uh, moving along that line is the infrastructure, health and safety. Um, so um, again, starting from the disadvantaged community, I mentioned lack of access to clean water and, uh, or um, water um, um, uh, for daily use. You can see, uh, we have, uh, as I said, state budget has been, uh, you, you know, we, we started this year with a surplus in our state budget now. We are, so in a deficit, and um, which means that uh, some of the um, um, uh, financial allocation to investing in water in so many different ways is under question right now if we can do it or not. Um, and also, the, uh, you know, unfortunately, water has not yet made it to any of the stimulus packages that the federal government have been passing. Um, uh, which is actually a sort of a, um, it's sad to see since water is an essential resource and we, none of us can live without it. Unfortunately, it's a hidden resource and not, uh, not much focus is given to it uh, at any given time. And um, another piece of it is, as I said, when uh, you know, this shift in commuter um, uh, population and the fact that people are using less water in some communities and more water in others, has been impacting the financial health of utilities, which ultimately means that they might not be able to invest or reinvest in their infrastructure or actually maintain and operate their system to its highest quality. Um, uh, also, uh, and not be, you know, there might be, probably there will be a lot more deferred maintenance at this time uh, because of this financial impact. Um, also, um, uh, you know, uh, you, some of you might know, um, people have been using a lot of flush, flushable wipes in, uh, in different parts of the U.S. and in California, actually, during the COVID-19, we saw an increase in, doing, in use of those kind of wipes, which actually caused a lot of infrastructure damage and uh, clogging, um, which caused a big, big outcry of help by the uh, water utility community trying to get um, uh, people to um, stop using those wipes and um, stop flushing them. After uh, or another piece of it was because the supply chain in the uh, toilet paper industry was impacted. People were using a lot of different things and they were flushing it down the toilet, which impacted um, the water uh, pipes, wastewater pipes, uh, which ultimately impacted the infrastructure system as a whole. 
um, you know, I can go on and on about the challenges that California has been facing because of the COVID-19 and our water resources. Uh, but I, I figured maybe I'd focus on a, lot, a little bit about the opportunities that we have right now because of this crisis. I would say um, a lot of it is actually along the same line my colleagues just mentioned in, uh, in their last four talks. Uh, but I guess one thing is uh, rethinking the value chain or um, supply chain process. Maybe we have to focus more on the demand-oriented um, uh, investments rather than supply-oriented investments. And actually thinking about how we can uh, make sure there is enough uh, diversity in the way we uh, have um, in our system that would not make it break for one pandemic or, um, or uh, one, one crisis after another. And that's basically building resiliency in the system. And I think diversification is definitely part of it. There is a diversification of um, you know, uh, customer uh, uh, groups that we are providing resource to or a diversification of assets and, uh, and financial tools. Uh, another piece is actually food waste. Um, it has a lot of water implications and the uh, water footprint of food waste is significant so as other environmental footprints. And I think this, this pandemic has uh, highlighted this issue more and maybe after we go back to our, the, uh, to whatever form of normalcy we may experience after this, uh, we need to rethink how we use food and how we have to uh, be more mindful of waste, not wasting uh, a lot of food and resources. Um, my colleagues mentioned about holistic approaches to issues. I think the nexuses are great. I think health, uh, water, energy, food, all these pieces need to be within it. And I think after every crisis, after every crisis, we realize this nexus is broader than every, all these different elements we have considered. So for a while, we always focused on water and energy, then it became water, energy, and food. And now we are realizing water, energy, food, and health are all very interconnected. I guess this is highlighting the importance of integrated and broad perspective on how we manage our resources as a whole um, and how we engage society as part of this process. Um, and, and as part of that, I would say, um, you know, the collaborative governance is a very, very important piece of this because we really do wanna break these silos. For example, in the water sector, we have, you know, uh, uh, Lassen and Kim talked about um, uh, recycling and reuse and uh, closing the water loop and trying to reuse water as many times as we can for various purposes. And I think uh, one, of the, one of the problems with that is we have all these siloed groups, like you have people who provide water to us, people who provide, who take the waste, wa waste water away, people who manage uh, stormwater, and none of these people are connected to each other or they work together. So these are, breaking these silos as one example has been extremely important in sort of creating this uh, circular economy around water and creating more reuse and focusing on reuse more. And I think the same thing applies to water energy and the same thing applies to water energy and food and health and sort of trying to these break these silos and create more collaborative governance at various scales, at uh, federal, local, regional scales and trying to create more cooperation across different, different, um, um, different uh, resource groups is very, very important. And with that, I'll hand it back to Annette and look forward to the, uh, the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Nusha. That was fascinating. It's, it's helpful to get the perspective of California in contrast to some of the other um, work that's been discussed. In fact, it's, there's some strong similarities you could see coming from Morocco, Bolivia, the sort of global picture, uh, Latin America as a whole. And it does seem like there's a theme that's come up. This, this is an opportunity in terms of um, breaking down some of those barriers between sectors and across scales, as Marta pointed out as well. Um, so thank you for those insights and, and yes, please, rethinking our supply chains. And with this, like I, we're going to switch over to our Q&A session, which is going to be led by my colleague, Brian Joyce. Um, I've had the honor of working with Brian on the first uh, um, project that I mentioned that's funded by CETA in collaboration with the FAO that La Sen's involved with as well as a USAID-funded project 
um, the Sustainable Water Partnership in the Mara River in Kenya and Tanzania. So with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Brian, and then if all of our panelists could turn their, their video on, that would be great. Thank you. Great, thank you, Annette. Um, so I have been actively monitoring the, the questions that have been coming in, and we've got quite a lot of them, uh, some great questions. So thank you, everybody, for submitting those. I'm going to do my best just to try to cover the range of them that we got. And I guess I'd like to uh, start by just focusing on some of the questions that we got pertaining to uh, the, the planning processes and how we address robustness and resiliency and are inclusive of, uh, of all the stakeholders. And so we, we got quite a few questions coming in uh, around uh, the, the issues in Morocco. Uh, so if, uh, the first question to Dr. Kenny is, is around um, uh, water or, or water management in, in dry countries or, or countries that have harsh climates and what are uh, some strategies for uh, improving food security uh, and reducing the, the water footprint at the same time? Um, thank you, Brian. Well, uh, I think uh, in, in countries where water shortage is, is, is a big issue, uh, we have different ways to deal with it and uh, with regard to uh, reducing the footprint of the crops. And one way, I think, is to uh, invest on the uh, uh, water use efficiency technology. And we do have now a, a plenty of, uh, you know, ways, techniques, technologies to uh, improve water consumption, water use efficiency, as, uh, or to use, again, water productivity, water productivity issues as a whole. And uh, uh, I think, I think, uh, a lot of countries have made very good progress on, on this aspect. Let me give you just one, 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 one example. Again, using data from, from Morocco. Uh, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, to produce one kilogram of oranges, people used to use 600 liters. Then we go into drip irrigations we reduce it, these needs by like, let's say 30, 40%. So we went down to from 600 to 300. Then using drip irrigations is not enough. We still have to manage it correctly. How do we manage it correctly? If we use integrate climatic data, evapotranspiration data and meteorological stations, all right? When we use it, that we reduce it by again 20%. And then more recently, not only that, people have been using some very sophisticated monitoring system to, uh, 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 to, to, to manage the irrigations. And then we reduce it down to 180 to 200 liters per kilo. So within 25 years, we came from 600 liters to down to 180, 200. And that's, that's, that's one example. I think for the future now, we have even a better uh, uh, solution using all these drone technologies and all these new technologies. So we have plenty of solution, technological solution to improve footprints. But to link it to the uh, food security issues, I think what we we little bit uh, forget about is the use of local material, local genetic resources, okay? Uh, in each country has its own genetic resources that are generally well adapted to their climate, that are generally uh, uh, requiring less water. So I think in the future, we need to combine more technology with genetics and the how now. That's one example. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question that we had in uh, was for, for Nusha um, about uh, shift in, in priorities. If we have um, a, shift towards more self-sufficiency in agriculture, 
Uh, who will be, what, what are the impacts then for other sectors and who would the potential winners and losers be in that case? Um, so I'm not 100% sure what self-sufficiency in agriculture sort of here refers to, but I'll try to sort of address this. I'm happy to uh, respond to a follow-up on this. But I would say, um, um, you know, agriculture, uh, going back to what uh, Lassen was saying, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated and fascinating part of our, uh, you know, uh, part of human beings' uh, livelihood. Uh, you know, we, we don't, in California, we don't connect land use with water use. So we have all these, uh, uh, you know, productions on, for example, orchards who, that use water uh, all the time. They're permanent water users. While California doesn't necessarily have a lot of water, it's actually a semi-arid area. It has a Mediterranean um, environment and actually is having uh, and uh, you know using permanent crops can impact our water significantly because of that kind of climate. So um, so some of these lands that are producing, for example, all these orchards, including almond, almonds or other um, orchards, um, you know some of that ends up being um, import, uh, exported to other countries. So do we so like, what, is that, what are our priorities? And a lot of these decision makings is a short-term decision making. So if I want to make money within this period, um, I need to you know, grow this much, this many, this much crops and sell it for this much. Uh, while you know, long-term uh, farming, these people who are generation after generation have been farming, they actually do focus on soil health, water health, to make sure they actually take care of the land, to make sure they produce, um, products that are local and are suited for the local uh, need and demand. So, um, so I think uh, sort of a long answer to, I think it's important to focus on efficiency. I think it's important to be much more mindful of how we use water, but also it is important to focus on uh, small producers that can actually do sustainable farming and can produce a resource that is uh, needed and actually connecting this whole land use, water use, soil health together rather than sort of uh, doing one-off change in land use that can impact significant water um, uh, footprints. And I think that is, that is key for California. Um, unfortunately, that's, I think we have a long way to go before we can connect these pieces together in a more systematic way. Great, thank you. Um, getting, getting back to Lassen for a moment, um, there were some comments about the, the energy, uh, the water, food, energy nexus, and your point about uh, how our diets are also, and health is related uh, to the current situation. And the, the question was then how do we integrate these health concerns into uh, energy or the, the water energy food nexus? And then what are some policy measures that uh, would improve the, the resilience in the sustainability of resources management? Uh, that, that's a very good question, actually. I think, I think uh, uh, I'm going, I'm going to go back to what I think Nyosha or somebody else has already raised the questions of uh, having people talk to each other. Listen, uh, in every country, we have a, uh, a national strategy or national program for agriculture. And we do have also national strategy and national program for nutrition. I have never seen health public authority talking to agricultural people. So I think simply by putting together these I think we don't we don't talk to each other. That's the question that I'm trying to make here. I think people they don't talk to each other. And Malta was raising the question of sectoral approach we have for many many years. I think this approach has proven to be not efficient anymore. And that's why the nexus issue is very important. I think we need to talk to each other. We in agriculture, food people, nutrition people, medical people. I have never. A few years ago, we tried to create a Mediterranean foundation uh, when, and the basic question was to have agronomists 
water and medicines and cardiolog and people from the, med the health publics talk together. We do not talk together. It's, it's even seen as ridiculous. Sometimes when you say, okay, do we, can we talk together? You guys are working on this and this. Nutrition said, well, I mean, I mean, why should we, why do, do we have something to talk about? I think the answer is yes. The answer is yes. And this COVID pandemics really is inviting us to talk to each other, to communicate, to have a holistic approach and to address every single question, not in very sectorial, simple way. I think we, we, we tested and we test this. In, in down here in Agade, let me give you one example and I will uh, finish with that. When it comes to the water questions here, uh, 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 back in 2007, what is it, 10 years ago or more than that, we had a severe drought for like one year or two years. And we we're about to shut down the whole economy down since. And the decision was, okay, let's sit together and talk for the first time we put around the table all users of kind, all kinds of waters. We end up by making what we call now in French the contranap, a source of agreement between all the white users. Then, and that was the, the first time in Morocco, and I think now it's expanding everywhere. So to make the story short, the answer is let's talk. Let's listen and let's talk, period. Thank you for that. And on, on a related note, uh, we got a comment in uh, uh, pertaining to what Marta was talking about with uh, linking political and in institutional uh, processes that are science-based. Um, and the, the comment, more of a comment than a question, was about uh, corruption, particularly in Latin America, being a, a barrier to uh, to implementation, and if you had any thoughts on that. Well, let me just say that Colum uh, uh, Latin America is not the only corrupt place in the world. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> we don't have a monopoly on that. I think the U.S. has a serious problem going on right now. But having said that, the issues that, you know, we say in Spanish that, you know, the problem of everyone is, is a problem for all dummies, right? No, it's not going to solve the situation. But the fact is that I do think that um, the COVID exacerbates all the inequalities that we've talked about. And it has exacerbated the situation that decision makers, both private and public in Latin America have generated under the past sort of era of economic growth. But it has generated um, serious uh, you know, um, mismanagement um, at many levels, at the same time that we have a huge informal sector at all levels. You know, Latin Americans have an ethical problem that we have to deal with culturally, right? Um, and that's something that I think as we face COVID, it makes it even more evident, right? The governments that decided to invest millions of dollars on roads that access the Amazon, and now we have Mil, you know, thousands of communities in the, in the Amazon that are even more exposed to um, health problems because of COVID. So all these things, I think it's definitely um, exacerbated. I have to say that I want to flip that conversation, though. I want to say is, what are we, each, each citizen of Latin America or lover of Latin America, doing to address the problem? I'm really tired of us keep self-flagellating over this, you know? I just feel like we need to right now just talk about what am I doing in my household that's making sure that there's transparency? What am I doing in my community? What am I doing in my city? What am I, and I have specific examples. Right now, we have a serious problem with all the health systems, right? As they're buying masks and all the equipment to face the sanitary crisis, you end up having oh, that the Minister of Health did this, that the Minister of the, that. But then you hear from a private business that says, oh yeah, I was able to get the cheap Chinese stuff and I, that way I got a cheaper deal. You know, those are the things it's like, oh no, the problem is the ministers, but I keep doing it in my company. So we really need to flip this. What are we doing to change the conversation? So to close, I would just like to um, send you all, if I can, and if SE would be willing, 
a set of principles that we are promoting throughout Latin America, saying these are the things that we have to think about right now, seven principles for the sustainable development of Latin America that we think can begin to change the conversation. The COVID is a crisis we cannot waste. We need to make this a game changer. And I think it can be. Many people that I think had never come together are coming together. And getting away from our ideological, uh, you know, comfort zones, getting away from our sectorial comfort zones, getting away from our uh, staying at home comfort zones, we have to change the conversation. And I think this is an opportunity. And I think Latin America, in terms of the corruption, it comes down to the individual, and I think that's really important. The robust decision-making systems can highlight the scope and scale of the problem, but it comes down to individual choices that we all need to make globally, I think. Thank you. Um, it, it, we did get some questions in about, you know, how do we uh, not lose lose uh, track or l lose focus and t how do we take advantage of uh, some of the positive things that are uh, that are being motivated by the current crisis and um, in, in particular w with respect to to wash and I want to direct this question to to Kim then um, what are then some of the the historically overlooked uh, social impacts in, in water planning and how do we include those that are most at risk? Thanks, Brian, and uh, thanks for the questions. Um, yeah, that's a very good, good question. I think um, there has been, if we look at the past, uh, maybe with the Millennium Development Goals, there has been a big focus on uh, uh, supplying access, no, uh, to toilets, to water, etc. But actually, seeing uh, how that benefits uh, the communities, how that benefits different groups in society, uh, vulnerable groups, etc., has not really been been on the agenda. I think with the SDGs, it has improved, but I think there is still a big focus on counting counting toilets, etc. Et so I think. And there's also looking at the monitoring system uh, and indicators, global indicators, etc. Uh, there are not much uh, detail uh, it's about gender uh, inclusiveness, etc. What what service they provide. So I think there's a lot that we can do there, and I think there's an opportunity to raise raise that that issue. Um, and yeah, I think I mean SCI we are involved in, in developing some tools to to kind of disaggregate the data so we can understand uh, how do, do the systems uh, promote inclusiveness. Um, but of course, it has to become, become mainstream in, in, in all the, the, the stages of, of, of project Im implementation. And, and I guess from, from, from policies quite, quite high up on national agendas, for example. But, but I think there's a big, big opportunity. And as I mentioned uh, before, like, I think elderly that it's really, a, if you look at research on elderly, it's really a huge gap on, on, on understanding those, those needs. And so I think uh, that we need to put, put stress on that and invest, invest in that, that side. And, and we see that they, they are extremely vulnerable in this, this situation, for example. Um, and, but also to get to them is also a bit harder. So I think we, we really need to, uh, to join forces to to get, get to that, maybe, yeah, maybe that's a brief answer. <laughs> to, okay, to that oh, great, thank you for Thanks. that. So, uh, on a related note, I'm going to ask a, a question to Laura um, about the the planning processes and the and the tools that we use in those. And as as people need more water for to meet hygiene needs, how do we consider those uh, new water requirements in in, in water planning? Thank you, Brian. Um, yes, I thank everybody for the questions I've been looking at. Yes, another uh, key aspect that, that in connection to COVID-19 and, and water is how do we secure water for everybody? And now that there's you know, the need to have 
um, water to wash our hands and the, the requirements that we had in the model, maybe now they're going to be more, right? And, and I would like to say that while COVID-19 kind of illuminated on, on or highlighted the, the inequalities, having universal access should be the priority always, right? So this kind of emphasizing that. And I think the work that we've been doing um, in Bolivia and, and I mentioned in Cambodia and trying to incorporate in with this aspect of uh, what are the people that don't have access in their homes, that don't have that, that universal uh, right. And so in terms of scenarios and looking at that in water planning and in WIP and how we can inform decision uh, make around those, um, those plans is that the, the conceptualization of cities and people, they need to move out of just being a quantity of a number in, in an object or in a node in the model, right? We need to disaggregate. We need to look at deeper on what parts of that, that, that community or that city that we're representing don't really have access to water in their homes and what that means in terms of the quantities that we incorporate in the model, right? Are those underestimated because they don't have that access? And what are the, what are the requirements that, that needs to be incorporated in the model? Now with COVID-19, we need to even increase those requirements and be more explicit in analyzing those. So we are disaggregating the standard we model, we are looking in, in uh, refining those aspects to incorporate water access inequalities and, and, and look at and what that means in terms of requirements and if those requirements that we're estimating based on data are, are real. And, and one of the questions mentioned the challenge of data. And, and that's why when Corp we did surveys, one of the questions said, okay, how did you do the survey now, <laughs> right? We were lucky that we did the survey just before the, the pandemic and, and we want to do that for the other watersheds and, and we're trying to innovate and find new ways to, to discover what are the needs, what are the social aspects that we need to consider in this model. So as we're merging these two worlds of the technical and the, and the non-technical, the qualitative surveys, um, you know, COVID is bringing those challenges as, as, as well. So, I'm trying to have a straight answer, maybe, but I hope I got <laughs> Thank you for that, Laura. <laughs> well, I, I, I think we're, you know, we have lots of questions that we're not going to be able to get around to. And I just want to be mindful of time and give you all uh, a, another chance to speak before we adjourn. Um, and, and as I do, I want to ask uh, two questions uh, before some closing thoughts from each of you, in, which are, uh, what are lessons learned from from are, are there things you've heard today that, that are lessons from one location that, we, that may be applied someplace else uh, in, in, for your, in your particular context? And the other is, how do we sustain positive change post-pandemic? So with those two questions, I will, uh, I will go, go in the order that, we, that you presented before, and we'll start with uh, Dr. Kenny. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the, the questions. And uh, I think how the way we can sustain the positive things we uh, talked about today is probably by uh, international cooperation. I think international cooperation would be a, a, a good thing for the future because uh, uh, one single country will not be able to deal with all these very complex issues. So international cooperation would be one, one thing to sustain uh, the positive thing. And again, the second point is uh, related to what I just said a few minutes ago. I think adopting a holistic approach in dealing with these very complex issues. That's my, that would be my second recommendation. So, and probably the third recommendation to sustain this positive uh, is uh, uh, to uh, look for a, uh, let's say, a bottom up uh, kind of approach rather than top down uh, uh, decision making process. I think uh, much of the problems we, we have uh, when we deal with 
uh, water issues, food security issues, uh, and the normal conditions, and also uh, uh, and, and the crisis and the pandemic crisis, is to rely entirely, I'm talking about, of course, some countries, not all the countries, to rely entirely on the top-down decision process. And uh, end users are not uh, 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 are not into the loop of the, uh, in the decision process making. So I think these 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 are some few ideas on how to can sustain uh, 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 these uh, uh, positive things. But uh, I, I think I think the COVID nineteen pandemic is giving a chance to the whole world to reshuffle and rethink its development models and in productivist models, models, economic models based on growth, 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 and productions. It seems to be seems to be questionable now. We need to go back and consider uh, social things, social consideration. We need to take ecology and social aspect into uh, into consideration particularly i mean imagine this is a three month pandemic crisis imagine you're going to have a six month a longer pandemic with a higher with higher impact what would be the the the, the and be just catastrophic if because we if we work if we are using the same tools the same way of thinking the same way of of making decisions that's not going to work. So we need to go back, integrate ecology, social. I mean, people have been talking about that for many, many years. We have climatic septic, ecology septic. But now the pandemic is just telling me, okay, guys, stop talking about this question. This is serious. Get to work. This is what happened with the pandemic. What would happen with the climate change? It's going to be even higher impact. So we need to stop talking and get to work. Okay, thank you for those thoughts. Uh, and and next, let's uh, let's go to Laura. And you need to unmute. Sorry. Uh, one key word that we keep listening is connection, right? Connection with. Uh, decision makers need to connect, not you know being fragmented. Uh, I think that connections between uh, poverty, which is a symptom of inequality, and with environmental degradation, and and how we need to get out of the different silos that we're analyzing um, things, and for researchers also to connect. And and water is the connector <laughs> on many things, and and I love that about water. And, and one example is, is how, you know, Kim and I were, you know, their model of wash flows and we were connecting, trying to make these two models touch each other. And in light of COVID-19, it's, I think it's, it's key. And, and I think that's, we could say one positive thing of, of, of COVID is, is that these connections, they're, they're being um, emphasized on, on, on how important they are in, in the different levels, right? Decisions and researchers and people and the analysis that we do and break out the, the different fragmentations that, that we have. And, and I think a lot of these lessons that we, you know, I talked about Bolivia, uh, Marta mentioned different parts of Latin America, but they can be connected to many other watersheds, uh, not only Latin America, but in other parts of the world. And, and I would, um, I would love to hear more and know more of how uh, the water community is trying to make these connections and trying to, to, to support all these different efforts uh, around COVID-19 and, and, and make sure that when we get out of all this, that we know better about the, the social inequalities, that we know better about the, the, the damages that are happening in the environment and, and that we can that we can work better, right, for, for our future. So, thank you. Thank you, Laura. 
And Kim, if you could give us your final some final thoughts. Yes. No, I think I think it's it's really like the COVID has put some highlights and and light on uh, the need for wash, and I think that is that is really good. At the same time, I, as I said, I see a bit of risk that we run quick into to solution. We we lose the opportunity of do something more integrated. We need to take in the uh, time to assess, uh, to do what many here have said about the cross-sectoral collaboration, to think smarter. Uh, I think it's been really good. Uh, we have talked about the sustainability of our supply systems, uh, reaching, uh, trying to reach uh, local sufficiency. I think if we do wash smart, that can contribute to that uh, in more uh, low uh, more uh, water efficient uh, equipment, for example, safe reuse, uh, making sure to close the loop uh, locally, but also in other waste waste flows. So I think there's a lot of chances to do that, but but still that is acting over the the sector. So 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 and that will need need time for that di dialogue to happen. So, but I I, I really hope that uh, we are a bit patient because I think. If we, if we can do it right, then we will really build strength to the to the future. And as uh, it's been said, like uh, in the, the next challenge, a big challenge that we see is the, the climate and how that will put further stress on, on water resources and other, other resources. So we have a lot to gain to build this these systems and increase local sufficiency uh, around the world. So I really hope that we, we, we take the time to, to do, it, do it right this time. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for that. And Marta, could you give us your thoughts? No, I would just say that because of the time and, and we need to be brief, I would just say that listening to Nuisha about California, which I think is one of the worst managed water places in the world. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, being the fifth economy or sixth economy of the world, <laughs> and what you've been able to, how you face this crisis, you know, if I think there's a huge learning to be done in the discussion and sort of what's happening at, at, at centers of thinking like Stanford and, and the role of, of Stockholm Environment Institute to, to bring these, these um, messages to all of us, right? Um, those places that, that do not have such resources, such capacity. We don't have the technology like California does. So I think there's a lot of learning to be, you know, promoted regionally. And I think that's my message to all of us. We've begun a conversation. We need to keep it going. Um, and yeah, I do think as Laura and, and um, um, Dr. Kenny mentioned, connection and conversations, because this, nobody has the solution. We don't even understand the virus. Um, it's going to be with us for a while. And in the meantime, we have to face the next climate change uh, impact that each community has to face. So, um, and the action is now. I don't think there's time to waste. We're already late. And so to all of us is we need to be empowered. We need to do things um, and we need to keep moving, at least making sure that we do no damage. Great. Thank you for that. And Nusha? Okay, so the, um, I guess I'll just, since we talked about universities, I'll touch uh, on a few things related to that. One is we actually really need to have next generation of nexus thinkers. Right now we have people who go through this educational system that's like siloed by itself. So it's very difficult for some of these people who come out of these systems to really think, it, it provide this broader thinking. And I don't think we should uh, get rid of like uh, de specific, you know, uh, technical focus degrees, for example. Yes, we always need civil engineers and, um, and social scientists and all that, but we also need people who can go across easily and go across these uh, boundaries. Um, another thing I would say is, um, I think as we are talking, this, this, uh, this pandemic really highlighted the importance of local solutions. And I think we have to consider as we try to export our knowledge, our experience, our solutions from location to location, we have to actually, I think we have to rethink that maybe we should think about how we can incorporate existing local solutions 
as part of building resiliency. We don't want those practices, those experiences, those long historical knowledge of how to manage water and resource and this and that be lost into our Western way of thinking because the reality hasn't worked for so many places and actually has caused more problems than solutions. And as Martha said, in California, even we are suffering from our over-engineered complex system that was built uh, as a uh, you know, great idea 50 years ago and now it's falling apart. Um, so that's very important. And I think when we are talking about nexuses, the challenge is scale, 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 right? So how do you sort of put all these pieces together thinking about the scale, temporal scale and special, special scale and how they kind of connect. Uh, and that is a piece that needs to be focused on. Um, I, it was such a pleasure to be part of this discussion. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, thank you all. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Marisa mm -hmm. to, to wrap yeah. us up. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm gonna just minutes to wrap up. Um, I feel I started this conversation or this panel and, and this webinar thinking we need some time to think and I feel, I feel we just achieved that. For the last hour and a half, we stopped the world and we're able to just be here, be present and reflect on what's happening. We have a, lot, a great audience, great questions. I love all the questions. I, I wish we had the time to go over them. We'll likely do some kind of uh, announcement, uh, sharing some learning from this webinar later. And this is the community that is aware of what's happening and that can raise voices with data information to inform robust decisions. I think uh, to, to, to really get it to the, to the gist of it, I mean, really these robust solutions are the ones that include WASH, climate, virtual water, that consider corruption because once all the data and information is out there, there's no we're going back and, and, and these um, decision makers need to make the right decisions that consider demand supply and mainly that it considers this cross-sectional uh, trans um, boundary um, and across boundaries and across sectors dialogues that we so much emphasize today. Um, I think there are many challenges. I think we're looking to what's working, how rapid response is working and how we can extend some of those uh, good benefits that are happening and good actions that are, we are seeing beyond what's uh, this moment. We have a window of time to, um, be, um, to, to motivate action, uh, these actions to mobilize water, sanitation, and food security investments that are right. And we, in this window of time, we can move from inaction to action. Um, I just want to say that we are also trying to do this through the Water Beyond Boundaries initiative at SEI. We, have at the, we are at the initial stage, stages of the initiative and we invite you all to collaborate with us on that, to share thinking. Uh, the idea here is to make sure that we are not limited to the watershed boundary, that we include ecosystems and that we engage all the stakeholders on dialogues that are rich and uh, that take us to the next level. So with that, uh, we'll keep you informed of any other updates on finding robust solutions in the, base, in the face of COVID. We will continue to work with partners and practitioners on this theme, and we will continue to keep our audiences updated. We will be talk, posting the webinar online so you can go over and share with your networks. And thanks for your time and participation, and we hope to see you next time. Have a great rest of the day. Goodbye. <laughs>